Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, um, first of all, for the invitation. I, re I really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to share some ideas. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm Associate Professor for Digital Innovation in the School of Health and Social Care. And one of the big projects that we're looking at um, over the next couple of years is this integration of AI into um, higher and professional education. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about the implications of generative AI in um, professional education. And I'm gonna share some ideas today uh, about where I think this is headed. Um, just a, a, a warning in advance, um, you may find this uncomfortable. Um, I'm gonna start with a few caveats and assumptions. Um, first of all, all of these are very early stage development um, in, in how I think about uh, generative AI in professional education. Um, and for that reason, a lot of the slides, all the slides, are quite content heavy, quite text heavy. Typically I prefer to use images, um, but I'm still trying to come to terms with some of these arguments. Um, some of the claims that I make are speculative and probably too optimistic. So some of these claims are, we will continue seeing a, an acceleration in AI development and this may or may not be true, but it doesn't seem to have any natural stopping point at this, uh, at this stage. I think we're going to see an increase in competence and the ability to complete real world tasks in generative AI. We will see a continued re reduction in bias and hallucination, but we probably will never get rid of these completely. However, we will continue increasing our trust in these systems as the responses that they give us um, increasingly map onto our own perception of reality. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I'll be upfront and say that I am biased. I'm a techno optimist, and I generally think that more technology is better. I know that you you may not agree with that. Um, I think that one of the problems that we have in higher education, especially in educational research, is that we compare the typical classroom to the ideal classroom. So we say that this one thing can't possibly replace this other thing because, and then we describe the ideal classroom. But the reality is that very few people in the world have access to an ideal classroom. Um, we talk about care a lot in higher education, professional education, but care is expensive. And for that reason, we tend not to have a whole lot of care in higher education. So again, these are all you know, biases. Um, and because they're all subjective, I could be wrong about any, any one of these. So we can definitely have a conversation afterwards um, about whether or not you agree with some of these premises. So just an overview, my general claim is that generative AI reduces the degree to which access to expertise is an obstacle to learning. Um, I'm going to go through this argument in a little bit more detail, but basically um, I argue that generative AI is an expert in a wide range of knowledge domains. It provides universal access to previously siloed and expensive expertise. This threatens the status of the university in its privileged role as the accreditor of expertise. We're going to see the rise of new education par paradigms that take advantage of um, the emergence of expertise on demand. And health professions education, I think, is going to look very different. And I think it's going to look different a lot sooner than we expect. And I think that that difference will be driven by factors completely outside of our control. So to start off with, uh, there are a few things you may have heard about generative AI, probably um, in the context of ChatGPT. ChatGPT is not the only game in town, and there's by now more than 100 um, generative AI systems. Um, you may have heard that these systems are biased. They are. That's because they're the collective consensus of humanity, or at least the way that we think about this is the consensus of the people who are active on the internet. Um, but people are also biased. So if we're going to accuse um, AI of being biased, we need to understand that AI is a mirror of humanity and it's reflective of the bias that we have. Um, it does make things up um, all the time. The thing is, um, sometimes what it makes up maps onto what we think of as real. Um, the fact is that it's making up everything all the time. There's nothing that it says that is true, that is bound to reality in any way. It's just that increasingly, its hallucinations map onto our version of reality. Also, people confabulate all the time. We make things up all the time. There's some significant proportion of your memories that feel absolutely real, but which your brain is just making up. It's filling in the gaps all the time. Um, so we do this all the time. We hallucinate all the time. And our word for it is confabulation. 
Um, and in AI, we call it hallucination, but they are the same things. Um, there's no data provenance in generative AI. So we cannot trace anything back to a single source. It's not a database where we can look it up in a table and we can put our finger on the thing that says, this is where the AI found this piece of information that doesn't exist. But we can't do that with human beings either. We have no idea why we believe the things that we do. It's a combination of geography, language, family, religion, uh, culture, the, the kinds of TV we watch, who we happen to have been born next to, um, who lives around us. All these things influence our values and beliefs. So just because we can't prove it with AI, um, I don't know that that's especially um, problematic. AI is incredibly energy intensive and it is a net producer of CO2 at the moment, but it doesn't produce more CO2 than industry transport and all the other things that we use every day um, without any question. There's also some interesting work that shows that the use of AI is leading to significant reductions in energy usage uh, across a wide range of industries. So it may be that um, the, the use of AI leads to an overall reduction in CO2. Um, but I do think that that's, these are all important things that we need to be aware of, but I don't think that they are especially problematic when it comes to the things that I'm going to be talking about. So just as a very, very quick overview of generative AI, when I say generative AI, I'm talking about things like ChatGPT, Claude, Bard. There's a whole range of other um, generative AI systems that we could include in here. Generative AI is basically a next word predictor. That's all that it does. Um, everything that it produces is a consequence of the fact that it takes a prompt that you give it, and it says, based on the words in this prompt, I think that the first word in my response should be this. The second word should be this. And all that it's doing is it working out the probabilities of the next word in the sentence being this, and that's all that it does. Um, it's actually mind-blowing that it's able to do what it does when all it's doing is predicting the next word in a sentence. Increasingly, generative AI is multimodal, so this means it can see, understand um, a video, images, audio. Uh, you can take a five-second clip of my voice, then give it a text transcript, and it will read the transcript to you in my voice. Um, we are seeing the most advanced systems that would now be able to take a photograph of my face and then lip sync that video to the text that I'm now reading. Uh, so this is all possible, and it's increasingly possible through natural language. So we speak to computers and they're able to give us um, these kinds of responses. Generative AI is increasing in competence. So I, I won't get into this in too much detail, but there are advances that are being made in, um, in language models that mean that we can connect what are called foundation models. So this would be GPT, Claude, um, the, the kinds of the names that you're hearing all the time, those are foundation models. And we can connect those models to third-party services like physics engines and Wolfram Alpha. So you may have heard that um, uh, ChatGPT is not very good at physics. It's not very good at computation. But when we connect it to a physics engine, it can actually do real-world physics. When we connect it to Wolfram Alpha, it can do advanced computation. Increasingly, um, we are going to see uh, language models built into everything. And by everything, I do mean everything. Uh, the next version of Windows has got generative AI built into it, which means that AI will mediate every single thing that you do on your computer. It will be built into the next version of Outlook, Word, um, Excel. So as you're typing in Word, it will have a panel running along the side saying, I see you've said this. Would you like me to pro provide some references? Would you like me to expand on that sentence? Um, you're making a claim here that's quite strong. Would you like to see some counterclaims? This will be running all the time, and we're going to come to think of it as intelligence on demand. This will be available for everyone, and at least some version of it will be available for free. There are always going to be paid tiers because it's very expensive to run these language models, and the more advanced functionality will have to be paid for. And because of that, we're going to see an increasing acceleration in the digital divide. People who can pay for these models are going to be able to outperform people who can't pay for the models. Um, and, and I'm not sure how we can get around that. Um, generative AI is simple. Um, and so like I said earlier, we're getting to the point where we can program computers with natural language. And so what does it mean when everyone on earth is able to build computer programs that can have impact in the real world based on their ability to provide instructions to a machine? So I think that's, we can argue about some of the details, but that's essentially the state of play with generative AI.
So the way that we think of expertise is that um, these are people, typically. Um, I'm going to make the argument that generative AI is an expert. Uh, but typically, we think of expertise as, um, or experts as someone who has extensive knowledge and experience in one domain. Uh, very rare to find people who are experts in multiple domains because it takes many years to develop that expertise. We typically talk about experts as solving problems, making decisions. Um, so in other words, they use knowledge to achieve objectives. They don't just know things. They can use the things that they know in order to achieve things. Experts tend to have a deep understanding of complex problems. Um, and that we think that this is probably because they are able to um, do very advanced pattern recognition through having seen certain scenarios many thousands of times. Uh, if you are a human being who happens not to have seen those scenarios many thousands of times, then you probably are not able to do the pattern recognition that experts do. Um, and experts can convey complex ideas really well. They can com communicate the development of skills, knowledge, and they can do this very well. So straight off the bat, based on some of those definitions, I would say that generative AI not only has expertise within, but also across professional domains. Um, if you've experimented with these language models at all, you will know that whether you're talking about physiotherapy, occupational therapy, accounting, engineering, physics, philosophy, it doesn't matter. Um, this is an expert across all of those domains and it can provide relationships and patterns, it can identify patterns across all of those domains. And I'll give you an example of that um, a little bit later. It has extensive knowledge and it has the ability to apply that knowledge in creative ways. Um, we say that machines can't be creative, but all that creativity is, is the ability to map connections across seemingly unrelated knowledge domains. And it turns out that AI is actually really good at that. Um, it can understand complexity and navigate through that complexity way more effectively than human beings can. And if you've experimented with any of these language models, you will immediately realize that they are incredibly good at communicating with people. Um, across a wide variety of different levels, um, uh, language ability, you can say, explain this concept to me as if I was an eight-year-old, now explain it to me as if I was a 15-year-old, now explain it to me as if I was an expert. Um, so this gives us access to expertise through natural language, which is not something we've ever been able to do. This is why we have jargon in, um, in, in our professions. Jargon allows us to kind of compress a lot of difficult ideas into a few words. Um, and you first have to learn the jargon. You have to learn everything about a domain before you can actually have a conversation with someone at the highest levels in that domain. Language models allow us to use simple language to talk about very, very complicated ideas. Uh, language models are constantly getting better at producing accurate responses to increasingly complex questions. Um, and this is largely because of what we call larger context windows. The context window is the prompt that you give generative AI. Um, the most advanced language models can take a prompt of up to a million tokens. What that means in practical terms is that you can give it the entire corpus of uh, the Harry Potter books and then have a conversation with it about any aspect of that entire world. Um, and so if you imagine the kinds of conversations that you might have with um, someone, there's a very large context window. And until recently, language models didn't have that size of a context window. We were quite limited in what we could ask it. Now you can upload a 100-page PDF, and you can start having an interrogation with the language model about that PDF. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have is that people think that these things generate answers, um, but they don't. They generate ideas. And if we think about it that way, then they are incredibly powerful. So don't ask it for answers. Ask it for ideas. And um, I think we are moving from... A, a, um, an age, an era, whatever, um, of information abundance through the internet to expertise abundance. And I think that this has profound implications for professional practice and education. I think that one of the main things that it does is it opens up, opens up access to truly personal learning, where we can connect complex concepts to personally meaningful experience. And I think anyone who's got any experience with teaching will say that this is a core skill of the teacher to connect a concept in your professional domain to a personal experience of the student. Now, if you haven't done this before, I strongly recommend that you do it. Find a language model, ChatGPT. Claude is one that I use um, a lot more often. 
This is something that um, I just did as an example, explain ACL rehabilitation using the metaphor of Formula One racing. Now, I could probably do this as a teacher. I'm not really interested in Formula One racing, but I could probably figure out a few relationships between ACL rehab and, and the specific area. Read the response that uh, Claude or ChatGPT give you in response to this question. Um, it's phenomenal. And then uh, I've got I've got the response in the next slide, so I can go through that in a little bit of detail. But basically, this gives students the ability to access expertise in a knowledge domain, and they can progress through that knowledge domain without needing access to a teacher. Um, now, that may be a controversial statement, um, and maybe we're not quite there yet. But what I would ask you to compare it to is not the best teacher in the world, um, but having access to no teacher. Um, so if it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm busy doing my work, um, who can I speak to? I definitely can't speak to my teacher. Um, so I think generative AI gives us access to expertise um, and gives us um, the ability to look at truly personal learning um, in a way that our professional programs definitely cannot do at scale and will never be able to do at scale because it's too expensive. We know that the gold standard for teaching is one-to-one. -one. Um, we know that for you know a thousand years, we've had an apprentice expert relationship where people develop skills and expertise through a very personal relationship through someone, a mentor um, or someone who has an enormous amount of practical skill and expertise. We cannot scale that up. And the closest we've ever come to that in higher education is the Oxford Cambridge tutorial system. And we know how expensive that is. And how is that going to be possible to, um, to roll out at scale in higher education? We know that it's not. I'll just leave this up here very briefly. Um, bear in mind, I didn't tell it what ACL is. Um, I didn't tell it what rehabilitation means. I didn't tell it that I'm interested in a physiotherapy context. I didn't say that I wanted it to split ACL rehab into early, middle, and late stages. It did that all on its own. Now, this is a trivial example. I could take any one of these points and say, I want you to expand on this point and give me a synopsis of this process in 500 words. Um, I can say, explain range of motion to me. You can't do this at the moment, but very soon in free versions of ChatGPT, you'll be able to say, um, uh, not only give me an example of what range of motion is, but draw some pictures of joints and give me what their typical ranges of motion are. Um, so, the ability to have a conversation with a language model about a topic that you may know nothing about by relating it to something that you do know something about is incredibly powerful and not something that we've really come to terms with um, in higher education. I tell my students um, all the time that they should use generative AI to replace me. So just like they wouldn't ask me to write their essay or to tell them what to do or to give them all the answers, that's not what they should be using generative AI for. All the prompts on the left are the things that we should be asking generative AI. So what does it mean? How do I connect? Can you explain? When do I know? All of those kinds of questions. And when you start asking it those kinds of questions, you realize that the answer to those questions isn't necessarily a fact-based answer. So the question of how accurate it is becomes less relevant. All of this stuff is about being contextually relevant for the student. And so the student, through having a conversation with the language model, can start to track their own pathway through the problem space that they're interested in. So I think when I'm saying use generative AI to replace me, I'm really meaning ask it the kinds of questions that you would usually ask me. But now you have access to a version of me, a better version of me, if I'm honest at any time of day, through your phone, through your laptop, wherever you are. At the moment, you need an internet connection, but all of these companies are working on running these models on your mobile phone, on your laptop. Um, so this will be accessible to everyone all the time. Um, we don't often think about it like this, but our professional degree programs are gatekeepers and validators of expertise, and they have a monopoly on access. And it's weird because in every other domain, this is a problem. We don't like it when institutions have a monopoly. Um, and yet in higher education, we've accepted that this, is, um, that this is okay. But if generative AI enables universal, cheap and reliable access to expertise, I'm not convinced that there's much value that professional degree programs add on top of that. Again, controversial statement. We can talk about um, whether or not we agree with that. 
Um, people will talk about access to social and professional networks, diverse worldviews, personal experience, but we're pretty arrogant if we think that universities are the only place that we can get access to those things. And I think, again, we underestimate the value of cheap and universal access to expertise. The fact that people have to pay an enormous amount of money and set aside three years of their life to go to university is a significant problem when it comes to looking at educating the global population. Um, so if we are really serious about being learner centered and wanting to improve access to education, then we need to we need to look seriously at the idea of cheap and universal access, which universities will never be able to do. So I think that this is going to push universities and our professional programs to lose their monopoly on access to and the accreditation of professional expertise. And I think we're going to see this through the emergence of new education paradigms and that these paradigms will emphasize being AI first. So what universities are doing at the moment is they're trying to force AI into the existing models. What we're going to see is other kinds of institutions grow up that are generative AI first. So they will design the curriculum. They probably won't even design the curriculum. The curriculum will be designed in real time by the student as they move through the learning outcomes that they need to achieve in order to align with uh, professional regulation. So they probably won't even design a curriculum at all. But anyway, um, the point is that they will start with the assumption that AI exists and they will build from that um, premise rather than what we do is that we take our existing system and we say, how do we force AI to fit into this mold? We will see truly personal learning where we have contextualized learning resources where everyone's learning resource will be created on demand in response to their personal need. No one gets the same lecture, no one gets the same learning resource, no one gets the same slides. Everything gets generated in real time based on the needs of the learner. Everything will be project-based. Um, it'll be about creating things that are useful in the world rather than just for their own, um, uh, just for the sake of it, like with a lot of assessment at the moment. How many of our assessment tasks actually lead to something that has an impact in the world versus something that gets stuck in a folder and never gets looked at again? Authentic assessment means that there'll be no artificial boundary between learning and assessment. We have this weird thing where we have teaching. We assume that teaching is connected to learning. Um, there's no real evidence that these things are related. They just happen to take place in the same or take place at the same time. Um, but Sometimes I think students learn despite our teaching rather than because of it. Um, and I think we're going to see an emphasis on skills, um, on real world problems um, in these new education paradigms. And I think that they're gonna threaten the role of universities as the gold standard for regulated learning. Um, I think initially they won't be as good as universities, um, but they won't need to be as good as, they'll just need to be cheaper than the average. So we don't need to replicate the best universities to start with. If we're, if we're able to provide education, professional education, at 50% um, of the quality of the best universities, um, but at 10% of the cost, I think that'll be a great start. Next year, um, new education systems will be maybe 60% as good as the best universities. And the next year, they'll be 70% as good as, but they will always be 10% of the cost. Something that we talk about a lot, um, but which I don't think we do very well, is to recognize that um, the student, the teacher, the content, they're all part of an ecosystem. Um, maybe I'll take a step back, uh, progress through the, through the argument. So we started by looking at, um, the universities started by looking at AI as a threat to the assessment paradigm and tried to ban generative AI and realized very quickly that this wasn't possible because generative AI is not a single website that you can just ban. It's getting built into everything that we carry around with us. However, universities have now shifted their focus to maintaining a separation between the students and the AI. So even in institutions where they are allowing AI, they're saying to the student, you have to annotate all the work that you submit or you make it clear what was your contribution and what is the contribution of the AI. So they're really trying hard to maintain the separation between students and AI. So we're seeing a reluctant acceptance of technology, but with strong constraints. Um, uh, Justin Reich has this book called, I think, I think it's a book called Systems Domesticate Technology. And the idea is that as we try to introduce technology into a system like a university, the system bends the technology to take its own form. 
So the original version of MOOCs were, I thought, quite beautiful. And universities took them and bastardized them and made them into something that was awful. Um, and universities tend to do this all the time. They take technology that could be groundbreaking and amazing and could really support learning. And what they do is they force it into the existing paradigm, um, which takes the technology and it reduces its functionality in terms of being um, good for supporting learning. We're going to see we're going to see an integration of students, AI, and hopefully lecturers, students, and AI that are capable of developing expertise, I think sometimes even in the absence of a teacher. And if you're interested in some of this work, you can um, look at what's happening with distributed cognition. And it's basically the idea that your thinking doesn't happen in your head. Thinking happens in a relationship between you, other people, between you and content, and increasingly between you and AI systems. We're seeing a lot of conversation at the moment about assessment reform, and there's a lot of noise in universities about you know, assessment reform and how this is going to force us to look at assessment. And I worry that we're going to reform assessment, and then we're going to tick the box and then say, okay, now we're going to move on with business as usual. And I think education reform would be better than assessment reform. I think we need to regard these systems as socio-technical systems where the social components of human relationships influence the design of the technology, and the features and functionality of the technology influence our social relationships. And I think there's a lot we can learn from complex adaptive, adaptive systems where we are not actually able to predict any of the outcomes of those systems because of the vast number of variables that are interacting within the system. And I think this is where we're going to find ourselves in higher education. We like to be able to predict. Everything we do in assessment is a prediction. We predict that based on this sample of a student's work, which is itself a sample of the entire curriculum, we think that we can predict that the student is going to be able to uh, um, make a competent healthcare professional. And I think a lot of the times those are just guesses. We've heard a lot of people talk about the impact of technology on education. People have talked about the existential threat to higher education. And so why is this new? What is, makes this different? Well, I think one of the things that makes this different is the rate of change makes adaptation more difficult. Um, this technology didn't exist two years ago. It was launched one year ago. Um, six months ago, it looked very different to where it is now. And in six months time, it's going to look even different, even more different to what we've come to expect. Universities, I don't know about your universities, but my university took six months to put together a committee to decide what they were going to do about generative AI. While universities put together committees, um, OpenAI is just building the next version of their language model. Uh, generative AI is widely available through web services, um, which increases access to basically every, anyone on the planet as long as they have an internet connection. I know that not everyone has access at the moment, but this will change very quickly. They can be integrated into existing services, which rapidly expand capability um, in a way that universities are not well set up to, um, to change. Universities took about 15 years to um, uh, accept email into their systems. Um, so we're not, we don't have a great history of integrating technology well. Um, AI provides personalized expertise through customizable interfaces, which increase the likelihood of adoption. So this is something that is very squarely in control of the user, not the institution. So I think we're going to see change being driven by people and companies. Um, and we've seen this already. Universities have not been able to control what's going on with AI. Companies just keep building it. Students just keep using it. Um, and universities are stuck in a position where they're not able to even understand what's going on. Um, and lastly, and maybe most importantly, is that automation and virtualization will significantly re reduce the cost of learning at scale. If this is something that we care about, if we want more physiotherapists, more doctors, more nurses, more teachers, um, all the things that we say that we want, we know that we can't scale to, to meet that demand through the university paradigm. Um, I think that this is going to allow learning at scale in a way that universities can't provide. Um, just to kind of bring it back to um, assessments, uh, I, I have no idea why we're talking about essays. I don't know why anyone cares. Um, physiotherapists don't write essays. Um, we can say that we use essays to develop critical thinking, but there are other ways that we can develop critical thinking. 
um, ways that are better than essays. So for example, one of the things that we can do is we can raise our expectations around assessments, move away from MCQs and essays. We can ask students to recognize local needs and start a business. They can build apps, they can launch websites. You can use generative AI to do everything on this list. Um, I had a colleague um, who needed to do a sophisticated calculation in Excel. He didn't know how to use pivot tables. And in 20 minutes, he had ChatGPT teach him from a very, very introductory level what pivot tables are to completing the advanced calculations that he needed to be able to do. So if you don't know anything about web development or app development, you can use language models to teach you what those things are. And they can write the code that, they, that you can use to launch those products and services. So, I mean, if you're a physiotherapy student and you recognize a need in a patient, you can build a product for that patient. You can build an app for marginalized service users. All of these things are possible today and they will become increasingly possible um, in the future. So what capabilities are enabled when everyone has access to a disciplinary expert, a teacher, a mentor, a friend, a writing coach, literature reviewer, research assistant, because language models are all of these things. Um, and I think we have not yet started to even ask the question of what are the implications for professional education on a global scale when generative AI is embedded into everything. So in summary, universities have historically had a monopoly on expertise, but I think generative AI will enable universal and cheap access to increasingly reliable professional knowledge and technical expertise. I think this abundance of expertise will disrupt the privileged role of professional degree programs in regulated learning. We're gonna see the emergence of new education paradigms that position AI centrally um, rather than as an add-on and universities will find it difficult to replicate these. Um, I think universities have thought of themselves largely as immune to what's going on in society um, very much like an immovable object, but I think AI is an, an unstoppable force and I'm not sure what's going to happen if universities refuse to adapt. Thanks very much.